Good morning from Washington, D.C. The U.S. Chamber of Commerce is delighted to co-host, along with the U.S. Department of Energy and Israel's Ministry of Energy, this U.S.-Israel Energy and Innovation Spotlight. And we're delighted to welcome hundreds of people from across the U.S., Israel, and around the world to be part of this discussion. Let me first thank the teams at the Department of Energy, especially Dan Blumenthal and Nate Mason, and the Ministry of Energy, especially Yana Greenberg and Michael Sherman for their help in putting this forum together. Let me say this is a very exciting time in US-Israel economic relations. While historically our relationship has largely been defined by defense and security cooperation, today the relationship is much deeper and commerce is a much more prominent feature in the US-Israel alliance. Bilateral trade exceeds $40 billion annually Israel is home to over 250 major U.S. corporate R&D centers, and Israel is one of the leading sources of foreign direct investment into the U.S. from the Middle East region. The result is a special relationship that supports jobs in the U.S. and Israel, creates new technologies that have oversized global impact, and contributes in significant ways to our economies. And this is why the U.S. Chamber of Commerce launched the U.S.-Israel Business Council nearly a decade ago to support business and advocate for policies to expand commercial ties. So much of the success of our special relationship is the result of smart, forward-thinking, innovative public policies that have created huge opportunities for companies to thrive in the U.S.-Israel space, from the U.S.-Israel Free Trade Agreement to agreements and funds supporting joint R&D and commercial partnerships. And the U.S.-Israel Business Council is a platform to engage policymakers to continue to push this relationship forward and to broaden and deepen the partnership between American and Israeli companies. Clearly, one of the greatest challenges today post-COVID is the need to combat climate change while providing the resources needed to promote competitiveness and economic growth around the world. The U.S. and Israel relationship has been driven by innovation and by innovators. And managing, harnessing, and creating energy and water is, is an exciting new vista for bilateral cooperation and an area where our countries can lead the world. The discovery of natural gas in Israel alongside other finds across the region is creating an unprecedented, unprecedented energy boom in the Eastern Mediterranean and transforming the region's energy, economic, and political future. U.S. companies are deeply involved with this effort, and the U.S. government has played a critical political and diplomatic role over the last decade. The establishment of the Eastern Med Gas Forum is a huge step in building an energy hub that will bring economic benefits to all countries in the region, and the Chamber is, a proud, is proud to be a member of EMGF's Gas Industry Advisory Council and support EMGF's work. Israel is also on the cutting edge of innovation around energy and environmental challenges. As a world leader in water technology, Israel is helping American cities, states, and industries manage shrinking water resources and increasing needs. Israel is also developing climate and clean tech solutions that can reach global scale through partnerships with the US and buoyed by federal programs like the U.S. Israel Energy Center and Bird Energy. We will hear a few examples of these projects throughout the program today. Just as our two countries have come together over many decades to invent solutions to huge security challenges, just look at the Iron Dome missile defense system, for example, our countries can and should come together to solve big challenges around climate and energy. We hope that today's program contributes to the bilateral dialogue and we look forward to engaging with all of you from the U.S. and Israel and our governments to generate policy ideas, business support, and engagement to further our relationship in this critical area. Thank you all for joining today. And I'd now like to introduce Clay Neff, Chair of the Chamber's U.S.-Israel Business Council, to provide some opening remarks. Clay is the President of Chevron Middle East, Africa, South America Exploration and Production Company, where he is responsible for Chevron's oil and gas exploration and production activities across the region. Clay, off to you. Thanks, Josh, and good morning, good afternoon, everyone. 
I'm very pleased to be here today. And as chair of the US Israel Business Council, I want to thank you all for attending today's forum. I'd like to offer a special welcome to Israeli Minister of Energy and Water Resources, Karin El Harar, and US Deputy Secretary of Energy, David Turk. I also want to give a special thank you to the US Chamber of Commerce's US Israel Business Council, especially Josh Cram, uh, for putting together this program for today. As many of you know, Chevron acquired Noble Energy in October 2020, and it has been an exciting journey ever since. While we have had presence in the Middle East for over 90 years, the Eastern Mediterranean region is new to our company and offers great opportunities. Israel's offshore fields, Tamar and Leviathan, are extraordinary. And combined uh, now, they now combined provide more than 70% of Israel's power generation needs creating greater energy independence and security for the country with a more consistent, reliable, and cleaner source of energy. We are also proud to say that the country's increased use of natural gas, replacing coal, has also made a noticeable difference in its air quality. We are also helped to provide vocational and technical training to enable the next generation of Israelis find jobs both in our industry and other technology-driven industries. Chevron and its partners are also pleased to continue providing natural gas to Egypt and Jordan, creating important political and economic links between Israel and its Arab neighbors. Let me finish by saying that Chevron believes that the future of energy is lower carbon. Our goal is to deliver affordable, reliable, ever cleaner energy that enables human progress. To do that, we are lowering our carbon intensity, we're increasing renewables and offsets in support of our business, and investing in low carbon technologies to enable commercial solutions. We remain deeply committed to Israel and the region and look forward to many years of continued progress and partnership going forward. Thank you, and now let me turn it back to you, Josh. Well, thank you, Clay. We greatly appreciate Chevron's leadership on the council and all the good work that you're doing across the region. We're honored to welcome to this virtual stage Israel's Energy Minister, Karine El Harar, and U.S. Deputy Secretary of Energy, David Turk. The Chamber and our U.S. Israel Business Council have had a great partnership with DOE and the Ministry of Energy for many, many years around these kinds of energy issues. And we look forward to extending that relationship under both of your leadership. Let me introduce Minister El Harar first. Minister Karin El Harar became Israel's energy minister in June, where she is responsible for the development of Israel's energy and water economy and the use of its natural resources. We're delighted to have you here for this first engagement with the US audience in your new role. Minister El Harar is an attorney by training and well-known champion in Israel for the rights of people with disabilities. She was first elected to the Knesset in 2012, where she was an outspoken leader and a legislator on issues related to children, victims of violence, and the inclusion of people with disabilities. In June 2015, Minister El Harar was appointed chairwoman of the State Comptroller Committee, which deliberated issues related to energy development, among other national, social, economic, security, and political matters. And importantly, she's also spent a lot of time in the U.S., uh, including here in Washington, D.C., having received her LLM from the American University College of uh, Washington College of Law and working for U.S. companies and organizations. Minister El Harar, we're delighted to have you. Uh, the floor is yours. Vakasha. Deputy Secretary of Energy, David Turk, ladies and gentlemen, friends, I would like to begin by thanking the U.S. Department of Energy and the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, U.S. Israel Business Council, for partnering with us in this special and timely event. It is clear to all of us that while the U.S. and Israel do not compare in terms of size and population, there is much that Israel has to offer, especially in the area of innovation. 
Israeli innovation has become a true global success story. Bloomberg ranks Israel in the top 10 most innovative companies in the world. UNESCO ranks Israel second in global R&D spending in percentage of GDP. And the top American company like Google, Microsoft, Intel, Facebook, Oracle, and many more conduct crucial R&D operations in Israel. It is thanks to creativity, innovative thinking, and breaking technology that the state of Israel has become known as a startup nation. The energy sector is no exception. The Ministry of Energy is the forefront in developing the Israeli energy sector to become cleaner, greener, more efficient and competitive while continuing to invest in new technologies and research. While placing our faith in renewable energies and emerging technologies, we have already done a lot to minimize the emissions by phasing out the usage of coal. We have been able to do this thanks to the neutral gas reservoirs that have been found in Israel water and due to international companies like Chevron that believed in the potential of Israeli markets. The Ministry of Energy, under my leadership, will be taking revolutionary and innovative steps to transform Israel's energy sector and put it into global arena. This includes encouraging a shift toward renewable energy utilizing sources, mainly solar power, but additional, also additional non-fossil energy sources. And this also includes combining efforts with our neighbors and aspiring towards regional cooperation in the energy sector that will benefit from all of us. We are talking about revolution. Without noise and fanfare, we will do this by working hard, removing barriers, setting ambitious but sensible goals, developing and investing in breakthrough technologies that will not only put Israeli scientists in the forefront of global innovation, but will also enable us to reach and even pass targets sooner than expected. We will do this in partnership with our friends, of course, like the US, and continue our close cooperation on programs like BERT and Joint US-Israel Energy Center and many other, uh, and many other initiatives. The State of Israel and the United States are generating significant value and benefits for both countries and maximizing the global benefits of this unique operation. I welcome you in joining us to this fantastic event during which we will hear about new and innovative ideas on how to take the energy sector of both countries to this next level. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Minister El Harar. We, we accept that challenge to help you and support taking this relationship to that next level and, and really appreciated your, your comments and, and the vision that the ministry has to, to do just that. And we look forward to hosting you back in D.C. Uh, when you when you're able to come through at the chamber. Uh, so so certainly, hopefully you'll, you'll come visit us. Um, Deputy Secretary Turk, I know this is not your first time uh, since you've been uh, with the Biden administration that you've been with the chamber. So thank you for being back with us. Um, Deputy Secretary Turk has had a very distinguished career in government and public service working on energy and national security issues for a long time. Uh, Mr. Turk came to DOE immediately from the International Energy Agency where he worked with countries around the world to develop strategies to manage clean energy transitions. And before that, in the Obama administration, uh, he served at DOE where he coordinated international technology and clean energy efforts. Uh, Deputy Secretary Turk previously served at the National Security Council, at the White House. Uh, he was at the State Department where he was Deputy Special Envoy for Climate Change. 
and has had senior roles in the House and, and Senate. So he comes with a, a lot of experience and know-how across the government. And I think it's fair to say that DOE is one of the least understood federal agencies given its expansive role. And, and I love what, uh, Deputy Secretary, what you said at your, your confirmation hearing recently, uh, where you distilled the mission of DOE as the place where our country turns to solve the biggest problems like climate change. And, and we look forward to hearing more about that mission and how the U.S.'s relationship can be put to use in its pursuit. Uh, Deputy Secretary Turk, thank you again for being here with us. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Josh. And let me thank the U.S.-Israeli Business Council for the invitation. More generally, uh, Clay, for your terrific remarks. And a special, special thanks to our new minister from uh, Israel, Minister El Harar, uh, thank you for your uh, terrific comments and uh, all the partnership our two countries have had, and I know will only strengthen even further under your uh, terrific leadership. I noted in particular a phrase you used, which I, I think this is just a terrific way to put it. I think you said uh, revolution on the clean energy front without noise and fanfare, which I think is exactly what we need to have a lot more of in the world. Uh, we need to walk the walk and we need to do what we need to do in our own domestic spheres uh, and to just get on with the work. So really appreciate that sentiment and look forward to the uh, strength and partnership with you personally uh, and with your team as well uh, going, going forward. And I think this meeting couldn't be happening at a more opportune time, both for the uh, already incredibly strong partnership between our two countries, our peoples, our companies, uh, but also the shared challenges we face uh, on climate change. Uh, earlier this week, we heard again from the IPCC group of scientists delivering a stark reminder of just how urgent the climate challenge is facing all of us, all our countries, all our peoples around the world. And the latest cutting edge science is really only confirming what we're seeing with our own eyes all around the world. Climate impacts are happening right here, right now, and they're threatening lives. We're certainly seeing that in the U.S. context right now with the wildfires, with the droughts, but we're seeing it all around the world, uh, all around the world, unfortunately. And of course, to uh, avoid uh, even worse catastrophe, chart a better course forward for all of our peoples, humanity and our planet, we need to reduce our emissions, we need to get our acts together domestically, uh, and we also have to work together across the borders. Uh, let me first just share a few things of what we're doing domestically in the U.S. under President Biden and Secretary Granholm, my boss here at the Department of Energy's leadership. We're trying to walk the walk. We're trying to get our own domestic house in order. President Biden has put incredibly ambitious goals on the table for what we're doing on clean energy, what we're doing on climate, cutting our emissions by half by 2030 and eight less than nine years, a little over eight years from now achieving 100% clean electricity by 2035 and net zero in our country by 2050. And as the nation, and thank you, Josh, for the nice words about the Department of Energy, uh, we view ourselves as the solutions agency, trying to reduce costs, trying to bring more solutions to the table to achieve these incredibly uh, ambitious goals. And that means deploying uh, technologies that are already price and cost competitive, like solar PV, like wind, while researching in the additional needed technologies of the future, doing the R&D work on advanced nuclear, on clean hydrogen, on long duration storage. We've launched a series of what we're calling Earth Shots to really use our 17 national labs, use all of our R&D levers, of course, working hand in hand with the private sector to reduce costs and really get things like clean energy or clean hydrogen, green hydrogen, and long duration storage in the market at the price levels that it needs uh, to be. It's also incredibly exciting here in the U.S. to see the U.S. Senate over the last couple of days uh, pass a big, big infrastructure, a bipartisan infrastructure bill, also a budget plan for $3.5 trillion additional investment, all of this going into the clean energy technologies of the future, whether it's on EVs, renewables, hydrogen, CCUS, the full range of clean energy technologies. This is the biggest infrastructure package combined in these two pieces of legislation that we've seen in a generation, historic levels of investment, and much of that on their shoulders of uh, the Department of Energy here and the responsibility that we'll bear uh, going forward. So we're trying to do whatever we can to walk the walk, to do what we need to do domestically, 
but we certainly appreciate we're not going to succeed on climate change uh, unless we work with other committed countries, other committed peoples, other committed companies around the world. And again, that's why it's so terrific to be here with our Israeli public partners and private uh, partners as well. Israel has a lot to be proud of on the climate front and certainly as an innovation powerhouse, even greater opportunities uh, to go forward. Certainly applaud, as the minister said, your commitment to move from coal on power, away from coal for power generation. Israel has huge opportunities to reduce emissions further from natural gas. The IPCC report, again, emphasizing just how important, just how cost competitive it is to reduce methane emissions from the natural gas cycle, from production all the way to distribution to how natural gas is used as well. Also encourage that Israel has energy policy out to 2050, looking to reduce emissions and really looking to uh, make significant down payments on the renewable energy target side of things, including and especially on the solar side of things where Israel has such terrific solar uh, assets. We're very pleased that we've got a strong level of bipartisan or bilateral relationship and partnership between our two countries, whether it's the BIRD Energy and the US-Israel Energy Center. Uh, Israel is also central as the minister, as you said, on regional energy cooperation, which offers huge uh, expansion opportunities uh, with whether it's the East Mediterranean Gas Forum, uh, Forum to the normalization agreements with the UAE, Bahrain, and others as well, the regional role that Israel can play uh, is even further. And we wanna strengthen this collaboration even further. We've got opportunities on the innovation side of things. We've got opportunities on the deployment side of things and look forward to working uh, closer together uh, with our two peoples, our two countries, our, two comp our, our various companies that are part of this uh, session here today. So I'm very confident our two nations can move faster, seize the opportunities and the huge economic opportunities, the job opportunities, the huge economic opportunities of clean energy, creating jobs, growing our economies and building the kind of safer, healthier communities our citizens uh, are demanding. Real world focused events and deals and action uh, like those represented by the participants of this session today, maintain this momentum, not only maintain, but strengthen this momentum going forward. So thank you all for uh, uh, participating today. Thank you all for what you're doing further and rest assured that the US Department of Energy uh, will be a uh, helpful partner, will be a helpful partner looking to be even more helpful into the future. Thank you again, back to you, Josh. Deputy Secretary Turk, we appreciate your comments and all the good work you're doing to advance par private sector partnerships and collaboration with countries around the world like Israel. We look forward to continuing the dialogue with you and Minister El Harar and to keep this momentum, as you said, keep this momentum going uh, and support more US Israeli partnerships in this area. And we look forward to hosting the next meeting in person with you all, either in D.C. or in, in Jerusalem. Let me now turn the floor over to our friend Udi Adiri, who is no stranger to the chamber. We've gotten to know Udi well over the last four plus years since he's been director general of the Ministry of Energy and played a central role in shaping Israel's energy strategy and energy transition. Udi's going to brief us on Israel's newly released 2050 energy plan to move Israel to a low carbon emissions economy, deal with the climate crisis, uh, a plan that was just recently presented to the Knesset. After Udi speaks, my colleague Steve Lutz is going to pick up the conversation with Udi and our panelists for the next session. Udi, over to you.
Thank you. Uh, first of all, I want, uh, want to thank uh, uh, Deputy Secretary Turk for his uh, important message and warm words. And also thank you, Josh and Clay, and of course, uh, my secretary, uh, Lara. Uh, so um, I will try to share with you in, in, in about 10 or 15 minutes the way in which we design, the way in which we see the future of the Israeli energy sector, of course, in line with the international trends, first of all, the decarbonization. Um, can you see the, the slides? Okay, good. Uh, so, first of all, I would like to share with you the way in which we design, what is the designing process of our policy. So, first of all, as the Ministry of Energy, uh, we look at the, what happens around the world. Of course, Israel is a small country, part of the global economy. And definitely what we see as the most important trend and the most important target worldwide is, of course, decarbonization. Together with uh, uh, decentralization of the energy markets around the world and the process of uh, digitalization. And I would say that all of those three together, they put us the challenge, but also give us some of the answers and the, and the methods in which we can deal with decarbonization. And uh, definitely we try to go in line, of course, with these very three uh, important, these three Ds, which of course, the first and most important is the decarbonization. Then we have to look at the local perspective. And uh, probably any country around the world need to wait, need to, to build a path to deal with the challenges. Of course, first of all, with the climate change. And Israel has its local perspective. And I will try to talk about six very important dimensions of this local perspective. First of all, Israel today is a, energy wise, is an island. It's not a destiny. Part of the policy, of course, is to change this reality. But for the meanwhile, this is a reality that has a lot of impacts on the way in which we could design our policy. First of all, the, we have a very high population density. Uh, uh, today is the third in the OECD, and probably very soon, uh, in the next 15 years, the highest in the OECD. It is a challenge, of course, we also have a very high land uh, uh, security. And it means that every place around the land of Israel is someone's backyard. So it's very complicated to design uh, infrastructure and we have to be very efficient in the way that we, lose, we use our land uh, uh, resource. And uh, I believe that our colleagues from, from, from Chevron uh, 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 today are more familiar with, with the way in which every place in Israel is someone's best yard. And we have a lot of sun, which of course is a very important advantage. I now move to the advantages. But on the other hand, the sun is almost the only renewable, I would say the only commercial, uh, big scale renewable that we have today in Israel. We have very small uh, potential of wind. If I put it together with the, with the sensitivity of the, of the landscape, so the potential of wind is very, very limited. We have we try to try to, of course, to implement it, but we have a lot of sun, this is important. We have a breaking through innovation in Israel, and uh, so we want to see the Israeli startups, the Israeli innovation ability is part of the solution, as part of building the solution, that in some aspects should be to, 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 to advance, especially the solution for the unique, uniqueness of Israel. And uh, we have a significant gas reservoirs that we share, that today are taking a more and more important part in our economy. And we have to see what is the future of this industry in line with the climate change. As a Ministry of Energy, we have three main uh, targets, three main goals that we have to take care of. We have to take care of the environment, uh, reducing carbon footprint as well as air pollution. We have to take care of the economy perspective. We want the market to be competitive. We want to, the, the, price, the prices to be affordable. We also want, of course, to produce and to uh, develop our natural resources, such as, of course, natural gas. And we have to take care of the energy security. And all of the three are important. 
And if the security is something that maybe only our ministry is taking care of in Israel, so we have to keep it in our back of the mind all the time. So with these three dimensions, we go to the process of strategy and targets. Uh, so what are our main uh, uh, policy um, uh, parts, um, policy goals? So I'll start with uh, phasing out the user's call. Until 2025, we want not to use any more coal in our uh, energy mix. We want to reach 30% of renewables by 2030, most of them uh, solar PV. Regarding solar PV, it is an ambitious uh, target uh, compared to other countries, but again, it's only, almost only uh, solar PV. We want uh, to have a uh, by the mistake here, but by 2030, 100% of the new electric of the cars should be electrified. So by 2030, we want to see no more uh, internal combustion engines in Israel. We want to move forward our R&D and to invest in that. We want to electrify or to move to natural gas the entire industry. We want to see no more heavy oil or diesel or uh, LPG in the industry, only electrification and natural gas. We want to see electrification of the household sector. We want to use our natural gas abilities and resources in order to export natural gas and maybe in the future hydrogen, first of all, in the region, afterwards maybe to other de uh, destinations. As part of our policy, we, our ambition is to use less and less natural gas in the local market uh, facing 2030, 2040, 2050, but to use this ability to export to countries in the region. Of course, by doing that, we improve uh, the Israeli economy, but also we contribute to the environment in the region. Uh, we want to improve very significantly our regional electric electricity and gas connectivity, as part of which the targets are uh, showing the went for 2050, we need this connectivity, we need to be connected to our neighbors, basing on renewables and economy cannot stand alone. You must have the redundancy in the connectivity to the region. So these are the main aspects of our policy. Now let's look at the numbers. So, uh, by 2030, the target that the government of Israel has, uh, has adopted very few weeks ago, is reduced 27% of our uh, CO2 equivalent emissions. I have to say that maybe 27% is not enough, but we should bear in mind that in Israel the population is growing uh, relatively rapidly, at least compared to the Western world, and also the economy. And but, but still we have to be 27% of the entire emissions by 2050. The target is a reduction of 85% in our CO2 and CO2 equivalent emissions, which is uh, an ambitious uh, target for 2050. So what is the roadmap uh, to reach it? So what you can see in this, in this graph, you can see the different sectors. It's only energy. You don't see you know, uh, agriculture or waste. But regarding energy, you can see the main components that, uh, that uh, produce the uh, greenhouse emissions. And so you can see the black one is the coal. And you see the coal is going to be vanished by 2026, we'll have no more coal at all. You can see that the, uh, uh, actually the, the electricity, electricity is uh, getting rid of most of the uh, CO2 emissions already by 2030, more than 50%, by introducing 30% of renewables and uh, stop use of coal, replacing it with natural gas. So by 2030, we're going to have 30% renewables, 70% natural gas. You can see the transportation, of course, taking more time because, of course, you need to replace the entire fleets. But from 2030 forward, you can see the transportation level of emissions in reduction. And the industry, by uh, uh, electric electrification of the industry and introducing uh, natural gas, also is going to vanish by 2050 when you're going to reach 80 to 85 percent. Actually, we have to update the graph. The target now is 85 percent. Regarding the energy sector, so as I said before, uh, our target is 85 percent uh, uh, decrease of greenhouse gas emissions by 2050. 
Uh, we want to do so, of course, by uh, phasing out the coal and by decreasing the demand. We have in, uh, um, a yearly decrease of 1.3% in energy uh, intensity. And of course, with, uh, if you take it uh, 30 years, 1.3% 1, 1, 1 a year for 30 years, it becomes a very significant part of the policy. This is just a, a very small graph. We just try to just to bring one challenge that we have to take care of. Is the challenge uh, this is known around the world as the duck curve, and just show you the com complexity in the reduction of high percentage of uh, solar PV. Of course, during the noon time, the most of the energy will be supplied by the sun. This is where you can see here the yellow part is the sun, which is yellow. But then, soon when the sun sets, you need to replace it all by, a, 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 by natural gas. In order to avoid it, we need to introduce a very high capability of storage. And the most, uh, uh, the, 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 the slide, the next slide is uh, the, the, almost the last one. I will describe the main challenges that we have to face with. And of course, without very high capability of storage, mainly uh, uh, based on batteries, we will not be able to meet the challenges since we have only solar PV, no wind, no hydro, and no connectivity. So what are the main challenges that we have to reach? What is the road? What are the main milestones in order to reach the 85% reduction in the carbon footprint in the greenhouse gas emissions? So first of all, first of all we need a lot of land. Uh, maybe, I don't know, in, in US uh, 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 numbers, it's uh, very margin numbers, but in Israel, it's not easy to find almost 1 million uh, dunams. Uh, we'll have to find ways to reduce the land that we need in order to install the PV systems. Uh, in order to reach the 85% reduction of emissions, we need between 56 to 86% of production of energy from solar, so from solar PV. At least 55. This is in case that we have much more technologies, I will spoke in, in, in a minute, but if we will find no more technologies, we need 86% of solar PV in our energy mix. And in, to do so, we need a lot of land. We need to be the first in the world in the way that we use dual use of land whether it's agro PV, water reservoirs, roof, whatever. Um, we need the complementary sectors to move forward. We need transportation to be totally electrified by a, a lot before 2050. And we need the industry to be mostly electrified or uh, move to uh, clean fuels. We need to develop, as I said before, storage capacity. Uh, today we have about 300 megawatts of uh, mainly pump storage, we need between 18 and 60 gigawatts of a, 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 a not in, of installed capacity for four hours. So it's like a, a more than 200 gigawatts, 250 gigawatts of storage, which is like 25 times what we have around the world today. We have to work on that. A very important part is the network development. We need to develop the network, the Israeli grid in order to absorb the electricity will be manufactured in different places around, around Israel, totally change in the way this grid is built, is built. We need international connectivity to be a very important component. We need to be connected to the West, to the Europe. We are working on the, on the MOU, we signed over the MOU with Cyprus and Greece to be connected to Europe, but we must be connected to the East, to Jordan, to Egypt, hopefully one day to the Gulf. It's extremely important in order to be able to base our electricity on renewables. And of course, we need a technological development to reach all of that. And I can say, uh, this is a graph that uh, I think is, 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 uh, is took from, from a, a, from a, 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 a publication. But what you can see here that for 2030, we have the roadmap. We have a very clear policy we need exact, we know exactly how much PV we need, how much storage we need to cut off the goal, we know. For 2050, 
we need to be based also on technologies that are not yet existing. And, and those technologies can be hydrogen, it could be green hydrogen, of course, it could be blue hydrogen, it could be produced on natural gas, it could be based on a, 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 a CO2 a, a absorption, and of course, new technologies of renewable energy. We need those technologies to be in place, otherwise it will be extremely difficult to reach the targets, but what we are seeing that all around the world, it is understood, and according to the IA, over 30% of the aim of the, of, the, of the technologies needed to reach the, the, the international cost are not yet existed. And of course, in Israel, and let me say one thing about the ecosystem, about the collaboration, we see great importance in the collaboration, of course, between the business sector, the academy, and the government. In the Ministry of Energy, we work a lot about creating, improving, and developing this collaboration. And of course, the thing is very important part of it is the collaboration between Israel and the United States of America. And we were very proud that uh, together with the DOE, we were able to establish the excellent center that is aimed is exactly to develop this kind of collaboration between business and academic and governments of the two countries. And we are, we'll be very proud if Israel, together with the United States, could be part of creating the solution, not only for Israel, and not only for the United States, but also creating the solution for the entire world, actually with facing maybe with the greatest challenge of humanity. So uh, hopefully we'll be able to move forward with that. Thank you very much. Well, hello. Uh, my name is Steve Lewis, Vice President for Middle East at the U.S. Chamber in, in Udi. Thank you so very much for that presentation um, on Israel's 2050 Energy Roadmap. Uh, very informative, and it was interesting to hear you talk about how the trends and local perspectives and the duties, as you called them, uh, helped inform the policy initiatives and targets that Israel's pursuing. Um, I'm really delighted to have you join in what I think really is a, an all-star panel here uh, to kind of further those thoughts. And our session, of course, will focus on developments in Israel and the broader Eastern Mediterranean in discovery, development, and collaboration around natural gas and the impact of these findings on Israel and the region's economies and relationships. So let me just mention joining uh, Udi on the panel, uh, in addition to my Basset Hound, who's uh, at this moment made an intervention, um, we're really delighted to have uh, Osama Morbaz, Undersecretary for the Technical Office in the Egyptian Ministry of Petroleum and Mineral Resources, but for the purposes of today's discussion, wearing his other hat as Acting Secretary General of the Eastern Mediterranean Gas Forum and a good friend of the chamber, and also two leading uh, business leaders uh, from the private sector uh, were joined by Brian Esker, General Manager of the Eastern Mediterranean Business Unit at Chevron Middle East, Africa, South America Exploration and Production Company, and George Picard from the Managing Director for Global Government Affairs and Policy at GE Gas Power. Uh, so as I mentioned, really a great lineup and I think uh, the right people to have at the table for this conversation. And Andy, I'd like to come back to you with the first question as a kind of a follow on. And we know that you've been at the center of policymaking, uh, first at the Ministry of Finance, now at the Ministry of Energy, as Israel has gone uh, a major energy change over the last uh, decade, moving from that coal-based economy to a natural gas economy. And I wonder if you could speak to how this energy transition uh, over the last 10 years has impacted Israel's economy, uh, the environment, and then, of course, uh, your international and regional relations. Uh, thank you. As well, I want to welcome our uh, colleagues, especially my colleague and friend, uh, Mr. Osama. Uh, so thank you all for being, for being here. Uh, so yeah, it's, 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 a, it's a good question. I can talk about it for an hour, but I think it's not, it's not the idea. So uh, first of all, it was, uh, I think it was a great blessing for the State of Israel. And I think in a few dimensions, it really changed the way 
uh, in which the Israeli economy and the uh, environment developed in the last uh, decade. First of all, it's the first time it supplied Israel with some kind of uh, energy independence, energy security. From the establishment of the State of Israel, Israel was a net importer of energy, and for the first time Israel became uh, self-sufficient, at least natural gas, and uh, also an exporter. In the last few years, thanks to the good collaboration with our uh, neighbors, first of all, uh, of course, uh, uh, Egypt and also Jordan, and uh, this is the first thing it's important. It gave, it gave us energy security, which is something that you could not underestimate. And the third, second thing I think is uh, economical development. I think that it saved the people of Israel, and we estimated from the from the 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 the, 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 oldest, the, the entire story is not much more than 10 years, maybe 15, but most of it's less than 10 years. And about production started, we have to remember, eight years ago. So it saved the people of Israel over uh, 25 billion dollars in, uh, in payments, especially in electricity bills, but not only. It's also provided the uh, government of Israel with another uh, uh, income resource for taxation. And, for royalties and for, for uh, uh, profits. But maybe the two most important things are the environment and the geopolitical gas. First of all, the environment. I think that by introducing the natural gas into the Israel energy sector, we are able to reduce the pollution. First of all, the local pollutants from energy, from electricity production, we reduce the pollutants between 15 to 25, in almost more than 20, uh, 92%, 92% reduction in the pollution. If we do that in, if we could do that in the transportation, we could do a very clean country. But also regarding, of course, the pollution, the is not perfect. The gas is not a solution in order to reach a carbon neutrality. We understand it. Maybe in the future we'll do hydrogen, but it is an important step in the way. Because once you replace the coal, you can cut the emissions by 50%. And the last aspect is the geopolitical aspects, and I think the very fact that uh, Dr. Osama is here together with us today. I think the the I can Osama, I have to tell you, I all the time I recall, I think it was 2017. With His Excellency uh, uh, Secretary uh, uh, Tariq Ebrun uh, stood on the stage with uh, Secretary Steinitz in Houston, Texas, together in the panel. And he said that it's high time after 40 years that we start uh, collecting the fruits of the peace. I think that this, this saying is manifesting the entire issue. And I can talk uh, 20 minutes long, but I think this is the, you know, it's enough to say that. And I have to say that not without difficulties, difficulties, despite the fact that it brought a lot of blessings to the state of Israel, uh, we are facing all the time difficulties, and uh, it's not an easy issue in Israel, the introduction of natural gas, but uh, I think these are the important things. Thank you for taking what, like you said, could easily be uh, its own session uh, and boiling that down into a, a, a comprehensive re response. And thank you also for teeing up um, my next question uh, to Osama Morbaz. As you referenced, uh, this has regional implications. And Osama, I'd love to hear from you, uh, given your current role as acting, uh, as acting Secretary General of the Eastern Med Gas Forum, if you could explain to us how the EMGF is looking to promote the development of energy for the benefit of that Eastern Med region. And thank you for being with us today, Osama, of course. Thank you, Steve. Thank you very much. It's really my pleasure to be uh, in this panel with such distinguished uh, panelists and colleagues. Uh, and talking about my favorite uh, topics, the EMGF, which I'm really very proud of. Sorry, man. I'm very proud to be part of the EMGF, and I think it's a great success story uh, that has been uh, done in a record time. The EMGF is originally uh, started as an Egyptian initiative, but once it was in launched and initiated, it caught the attention of the member countries and also of 
a lot of the other stakeholders within the region and outside of the region. One of them is definitely the U.S. And the U.S. has been part of the EMGF from the very beginning. They have been a big supporter of the EMGF and recently have joined as an observer. And I think one of the main objectives of the EMGF is how can the assets and the natural resources in the region, how can be it monetized and utilized to the benefit of the people? And I think in, in this, in the EMGF, we see for the first time, one of the rare times, how can energy be a catalyst of peace? And instead of the classical picture of energy being a fuel for uh, conflict, how can we use this to more to get more economic integration and eventually alleviate some of the political tensions? And I think we have achieved this to, to a great extent. We have seen the progress that the EMGF has done. In the record time, the statute was uh, approved. In the record time, the statute was signed and endorsed and uh, got into force. And now we started uh, maybe as seven founding members, but now the EMGF has grown, adding more members, more observers, including the US, the World Bank, and the EU. We're very excited about what we have done, and also we're very excited about the next steps. How can we uh, get more cooperation, add more initiatives, add more uh, countries, whether as observers or even as supporters of the EMGF? We're very excited about our next steps. Thank you, Steve. Well, thank you very much, Osama. And I have to say, as the chamber, we're also proud to be a member of the Gas Industry Advisory Committee. And I know uh, uh, many of our member companies are as well. And we thank you for your leadership on the, the EMGF, what you've done to date and what the aspirations are. Um, Brian, if I can come to you next. Um, you know, as countries really around the world, you know, endeavor to get out of this pandemic, uh, one of the key priorities, of course, and top of mind for the chamber and, and our guests today is economic growth. So could you speak to what Chevron is doing to support economic growth in Israel and the wider region through the availability of energy resources? Sure. Thanks, Steve. And uh, thanks for having me. I appreciate uh, the opportunity. Um, first, you know, the world will need reliable and affordable energy to meet the demands of an um, increasing world population, which we expect to be about 10 billion by 2050. Chevron is committed to providing affordable, reliable, ever cleaner energy. We're well positioned to help supply the world's future energy needs, thereby improving lives, supporting economic growth and enabling human progress. <clears throat> the high tech oil and gas industry continues to find innovative ways to meet global energy demand. Continued advances in oil and gas technology are unlocking new resources to help meet future energy needs affordably and reliably. In Israel, gas from Tamar and Leviathan are helping to fuel the economy, improve air quality, and provide energy independence for a country that was completely reliant on imports. 160 local Israeli companies worked on Leviathan's development with one Israeli company supplying over 10,000 valves um, approximately 70% of our Chevron Mediterranean Limited employees are Israelis who have received specialized energy training from the company. We're also operating and developing a social investment program in, in Israel that will invest millions um, to train local energy professionals. That's fantastic. And thank you for that overview. Very helpful. Um, and, and, and George, I'd like to come to you, you know, coming back to this uh, idea of energy transition, could you speak to how GE has responded to the energy transition in Israel uh, to support smart utilization of natural gas for Israel's economy? Sure, Steve. Thank you. And, and also, thank you for inviting me. It's really an honor to be here uh, with Udi Adiri and Osama Babarez and, and Brian Esner from, from Chevron. Um, look, this is a, a critical topic for GE and, and one that we're deeply involved in. So about 30% of the world's electricity uh, moves on GE equipment. And, you know, we've been doing this for decades uh, and we have deep interaction with governments around the world, such as those represented on the panel today, our customers, other stakeholders in, uh, 
in the energy sector and beyond. And so we've got a deep well of experience and, and frankly, our, our perspectives about how to deal with this energy transition. Um, I didn't have the, uh, the luxury of listening in on some of the earlier presentations, but I'm quite confident that, you know, there was discussion around the, the recent IPPC report and, and the level of urgency that's required uh, in, in order to meet the world's decarbonization objectives and, and avoid some catastrophic results. And, um, you know, there's just a level of urgency that we see. And, and GE, um, you know, we look at it from a, a couple of different lenses. Um, first of all, getting our own house in order. Um, you know, back in the 90s, we initiated our eco-imagination campaign, which really, you know, got us started down a path of, of green technology. Uh, but more recently, you know, we've, we've increased our, our, our pledges for uh, carbon neutrality by 2050. So we're looking not just scope one and two emissions, but also scope three emissions. And so we, we feel like we're doing our part as a responsible corporate citizen uh, to, to help believe, you know, mitigate the, uh, the challenges of climate change and advance the energy transition. At the same time, we see a tremendous need for a, really a decade of action uh, in, in order to stave off some of the worst consequences that were outlined in that IPPC report. So it, I think it's no secret to many on the discussion, you have to electrify different sectors of the economy, such as transportation and, and buildings and heat. Um, in the power sector, you need to deploy renewables as rapidly and widely as possible. And then along with that, you really need to um, focus on the smart use of, of gas as a resource, both to accelerate, accelerate the retirements of coal uh, uh, fire generation around the world, and also, frankly, to support the wider deployment of renewables by uh, providing available and dispatchable and affordable power at times when the wind is not blowing or the sun isn't shining. And then you've got to innovate. You really have to invest in a couple of different key areas. Uh, the development of small modular reactors for you know, zero uh, carbon nuclear power, strengthening the grid so you can get those zero carbon resources to the point of load, uh, employing digital technology software to make that grid more efficient and, and more secure. And perhaps most importantly, investing in the decarbonization, decarbonization of gas itself. And you know, that's through the introduction of hydrogen as a fuel source, which our technology is able to, uh, to combust and produce electricity with, or the utilization of carbon capture and storage on, on the back end. So that way you can invest in a gas facility now, accelerate that quick decarbonization through the retirement or, or you know, the, the moves away from, from coal, but also not, not lock in carbon emissions for the for the duration of the life of the plant as you can move to decarbonate it decarbonize it through hydrogen and, and ccus so we're working closely with governments around the world i think israel's a terrific example of this um, you know we were in, uh, installing a 1.2 gigawatt uh, advanced natural gas combined cycle plant at hadira uh, which is effectively going to replace generation from the 1970s era coal-fired facility. So that's about a 60% reduction in carbon emissions uh, right there. We're working to deploy uh, onshore wind technology uh, and, and likewise, um, you know, through the utilization of pump storage. Um, but equally as important in, to the deployment of technology is also knowledge sharing. So we're working to set up some advanced seminars uh, with stakeholders in Israel, the IEC, and the respective ministries to focus on things like advanced gas turbine technology, utilization of hydrogen as a fuel, utilization of CCUS on the back end of the plant, energy storage systems, which obviously are critical to this transition, and, and then the wider deployment of digital technology. So ultimate, we're, we're doing the same thing in, in Egypt, frankly, where we're seeking to share our knowledge and perspectives uh, with the relevant stakeholders there. So effectively, Steve, what we're trying to serve as is, is really a trusted partner uh, to a lot of stakeholders around the world. Um, and and uh, we foresee, you know, a, a tremendous need for collaboration between government with the private sector and other stakeholders in order to facilitate this transition. Well, thank you, George. A lot of, a lot of themes to pick up on there. And as you and Brian both alluded to, I think uh, the collaboration between the private and public sectors is absolutely critical to tackle the challenge. And then, you know, the need to, again, collaborate on technology and innovation and, and deploy that in a commercial way. So thanks for that and elaborating on that. 
Uh, a lot of great phrases people have used. And Osama, I want to come back. I, I have to say, if you haven't trademarked energy catalyst for peace, uh, you, you should trademark that or put that on bumper stickers. That was a, a great phrase, very interesting. And I do want to pick up, um, Osama, coming back to you. Um, what are some of your major takeaways from the recent ministerial meeting hosted in Egypt? And if you could also share with us, what is the ambition of the EMGF you know, over the next five year, uh, over the next five years? Thank you, Steve. Thank you very much. So I think um, we, in the EMGF, we're trying to work on two parallel tracks. One is the to continue the establishment institutional setup of the uh, of the organization. And also at the same time, we want we don't want to lose uh, time in, in, in legal issues. We want to work uh, as diligently and extensively as possible on the achieving the main objectives of the forum. And this is it was clear in the last ministerial meeting. So on the institutional setup and the establishment of the forum, we have finalized the, uh, as I said, the statute, the regulations uh, necessary for the establishment of the secretariat. This was endorsed by the ministers. We also signed the uh, headquarters agreement between the government of Egypt and the uh, the organization. We also uh, finalized a lot of the issues for the uh, setup of the uh, of the organization. In addition to this, as also one of the discussions or the points raised by Steve and also by uh, George, how can we uh, engage the private sector along with the forum? So in the forum, we have two main arms, let's say, which is the government under the, the ministerial meeting, the executive board. And at the same time, we have another arm for the industry, the private sector, the financial institute, which is the gas industry advisory committee. And we're trying to work on both uh, and coordinate with both uh, in the same, uh, let's say, in the same level. So. Um, in the last ministerial meeting, one of the updates is the uh, we have already established uh, a working group for the decarbonization, which is in line uh, with, with the energy transition. It was, I think, one of the uh, main objectives or uh, topics of this session of, and of this seminar. And we're trying to do this in alignment with the private sector. And one of the members of the guy, as you said, Steve, is Chevron. We have Brian with us. So we're trying to develop this, see what are the uh, lessons learned from the companies? How can this, this support the government's uh, uh, objectives and efforts in that? And how can we make sure that the uh, governments are aligned with the policies? And at the same time, the companies are aligned with the technologies and the investments. So I think I believe we are progressing in the, in the uh, right direction. Uh, we're already aligned with the different uh, uh, subcommittees in the GIAC, trying to uh, utilize their technologies and uh, updates to get the governments see what are the pro uh, proper policies and strategies to achieve this uh, these objectives. Thank you, Steve. Well, some of that, that's very interesting. And in, in, in my mind, the EMGF in its very essence embodies that spirit of cooperation between uh, the, the public and private sector vis-a-vis uh, -vis the, the GAIAC. And, and kudos to you and all the founding countries uh, for making sure that industry was at the table from day one, um, because we know that that's really critical, you know, if we're going to get where we need to get to. So thank you for that and, and the leadership and your comments on that. Um, uh, Brian, playing on that, I would love to hear, you know, uh, Osama specifically mentioned the the uh, EMGFs, this uh, decarbonization working group. But if you can speak more broadly, too, about uh, knowing that Chevron is one of the largest oil and gas companies in the world. If you could speak to as governments look to lower a lower carbon future, what is Chevron doing to mitigate uh, those effects of climate change? Sure. So uh, at Chevron, we believe the uh, future of energy is lower carbon. Um, we support the global net zero ambitions of the Paris Agreement uh, and are working to lower the carbon intensity of our operations, increase the use of renewables and offsets in support of our business and invest in low carbon technologies to enable, <clears throat> to enable commercial solutions. Reaching global net zero will require many different stakeholders to play many different roles. 
Chevron is focused on our actions that drive measurable progress towards higher returns. Affordable, reliable, ever cleaner energy is essential to achieving a more prosperous and sustainable world. We believe reducing the carbon intensity of our energy on which billions of people rely every day is a tremendous opportunity to make progress towards the global net zero ambitions of the Paris Agreement and build a lower um, economy. We're advancing opportunities to develop renewables and offsets that improve, return, uh, improve returns and help reduce scope two and in some cases scope three emissions. We're investing in renewable fuels, products and power with the aim of making energy and global supply chains more sustainable. We strive to apply our capabilities towards developing and commercializing breakthrough technologies, helping create lower carbon solutions that can compete effectively in the marketplace and ultimately achieve global scale. We know that new breakthroughs will be needed to achieve the world's net zero ambition. And that's why we're investing, innovating and integrating new solutions. Just this month, we announced a new business called Chevron New Energies that will focus on commercializing hydrogen, carbon capture and storage and offsets, as well as supporting growth in biofuels. We believe that these actions will make energy and global supply chain more sustainable, helping industries and customer realize their own low, lower carbon goals. We will work collectively to advance the global energy transition, deliver for our partners and stakeholders and achieve a better future for all. Great, uh, Brian, that's very interesting. And we look forward to hearing more about that uh, new development that was just announced. Uh, very, very interesting. Uh, George, I wanna to come to you. Uh, we know that GE Power works across uh, the energy value chain. If you could tell us where the company is investing in innovation and how does GE see its role in mitigating the impact of climate change? Yeah, sure, Steve, thanks. I, I think I touched upon a number of things in my introductory remarks, which, you know, talked about where, where GE is focusing. And, you know, we have a broad for portfolio in, in renewables and gas power, uh, other forms of generation, nuclear, the grid, et cetera. And, um, you know, I think we're, in, we're investing in all of these technologies really to, to make them more efficient and ultimately to help the world deliver uh, on its uh, decarbonization uh, objectives. Um, but but it's, a, it, it, it's an issue, it's a challenge that, that can't be addressed by the private sector alone. And, and I think you know, there really does need to be a strong partnership between uh, government and the private sector and, and other stakeholders, both in fashioning the right policy regime, the corresponding regulations, uh, and also to ensure that this transition transition advances as quickly as possible. So, um, you know, the U.S. Department of Energy is, is one of the co-sponsors of this event. We're, we're really pleased to see the leadership that this administration is exercising in the climate field. Uh, I think, you know, internationally in the lead up to COP26, uh, but, but also, frankly, investing in resources. Um, that will drive technology and, and technology deployment to uh, advance this energy transition. So I think everybody on the, on the, uh, in the conference is aware uh, of the recent activity in the US Congress where they're, we're on the verge of, of really making some significant investments. Uh, and from GE's perspective, some of the most important of those really revolve around um, driving the use of hydrogen as a fuel and advancing the deployment of carbon capture and storage, um, you know, both on the front end and the back end. Uh, you know, I look at it from the perspective of a natural gas plants, and, and these technologies are absolutely critical to the future. And a lot of the technology advances have already been made to, to, to go down this path, but there really lacks uh, a basic infrastructure to make that be to make that work at scale and at a sufficient um, you know level of cost effectiveness in order to truly have an impact. So I think industry working together with government to focus on some of these key areas, others I mentioned with advanced nuclear, uh, with the grid, with digital, um, with storage, uh, all, all of these matter. And, um, you know, GE, this is really the heart and soul uh, of what we're focused on over the next decade and well beyond. George, thank you very much. A lot of, a lot of more great uh, food for thought there. Um, we're, we're coming up on uh, time when we have to, to wrap our panel. So on behalf of the U.S. Chamber and our U.S. Israel Business Council, uh, Osama Morbaz, I want to thank you as acting 
the Secretary General for the EMGF for being with us, uh, Brian Esther from Chevron, George Picard from GE. Thank you all for contributing to this discussion. Uh, very interesting to hear about uh, natural gas as uh, the energy transition bridge to a lower carbon future. A lot of emphasis on the role that the EMGF is playing in regional energy cooperation and the important role between uh, the, the, the necessary role for government and private sector to collaborate and the strong emphasis placed on technology and innovation and investing that uh, to achieve the goals that we that we all agree will be mutually beneficial. So to our panel, thank you so much for taking time out of your schedule to be with us and contributing to today's discussion. I'm going to turn things over to uh, Gildian Friedman, a chief scientist at Israel's Ministry of Energy, who will lead and moderate the next discussion. So thank you all very much. With that, our panel is concluded. Hi everyone, good morning and good evening. I'm very happy to participate in this joint uh, US and Israeli event. We will now start a panel and focus on the innovation and what is driving uh, the innovation in US and Israel. We will meet uh, public and private sector uh, partners that, uh, uh, that are trying to develop the technologies that will enable us to achieve our long-term uh, targets of clean energy. Uh, we have a great panel here today uh, with us. Uh, we have uh, Dan Shantz, a professor of chemical and biomolecular engineering at Tulane University. Uh, he is also the leader uh, of the US-Israel um, uh, Consortium on Fossil Energy as part of the Energy Center of the uh, US and Israel. We have uh, Mr. Eshkhar Hetzroni, who is the business development, uh, vice president of business development at Ogwint, uh, which is a start startup company in Israel. And we have Al-Ad Shaviv, uh, Executive Director of Energycom, which is a new energy community endeavor uh, uh, that started uh, uh, with the Ministry of Energy and the Ministry of the, of the Economy. Before we start with the panel, I want to discuss a little bit what we are doing at the Ministry of Energy in terms of our uh, innovation efforts. Uh, we have uh, recently uh, published our 2050 targets, and uh, Mr. Udi Adiri, our Director General, uh, discussed that in more detail. Uh, but I will, would like to mention a few of our uh, challenges, the technological challenges that we face. Uh, Israel is a small country, so we are very uh, concerned about the efficiency of the conversion of the energy from solar from uh, solar energy to electricity. So we want panels that are more efficient than today. Of course, we need uh, energy storage and lots of cheap and efficient uh, energy storage in order to be able to uh, generate electricity uh, during 24 hours, uh, 365 days a year, and not only when the sun shines. And Israel has mainly solar and uh, uh, renewable energy as its uh, renewable source. Uh, Israel, again, is a small country, so we need the uh, dual-use technologies. We want to be able to produce solar uh, while using the land for other uses, for example, agricultural uses, which uh, we have challenges with the transmission. Israel is a very densely populated the transmission from the generation sites to the centers of populations is a big challenge for us. And, of course, we have our gas uh, reserves, which we want to use as cleanly as possible uh, and in a clean, eventually in a completely clean way. So uh, these are very um, challenging goals, and we are uh, trying to support innovation in three ways uh, as the Minister of Energy. We have an academic support program. We have an uh, industrial support programs. A program uh, both uh, for startups and for more developed uh, companies with pilots. Uh, in terms of our collaboration with the US, the uh, US, of course, is our uh, strongest partner for collaboration. We believe in collaboration. We think uh, Israel will not, of 
course, solve the problems of the world on its own. Uh, we rely on all the, on the, the talents and the capabilities of other countries, and may, and the U.S. Uh, of course uh, is a leader there. Uh, we have two programs already running for uh, quite a long time uh, to support uh, innovation in the energy market. One is called Bird Energy. It's running for over 10 years now, and in this program. Uh, two companies or a company, an academic uh, research institute, uh, take a project together, a development project together, and they are supported by uh, the both ministries. The newer program is called the U.S. Israel Center of Excellence. Uh, in this program, we have uh, four consortia, which were already uh, chosen uh, last last year. The consortia uh, take on four challenges which are uh, energy storage, water and uh, energy, uh, cyber security, and uh, fossil uh, fuels. Uh, with this, I would like to turn uh, to our panel, and uh, I would like uh, to uh, start with Dan Shantz, Professor Shantz. Uh, please go ahead, tell us a little bit about the U.S.-Israel Center of Excellence and your uh, impression on the collaboration and uh, uh, how both, uh, both sides can benefit and benefit in practice uh, from the collaboration. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Gideon. And, and thank you to the chamber uh, for inviting me to this most interesting meeting. Uh, I am a faculty member at Tulane University and the co-executive director of the U.S. Israel Fossil Energy Center. Uh, as mentioned, the center is supported by the U.S. Department of Energy uh, and the Energy Ministry of Israel and is administered through the Bird Foundation. So we were established approximately a year ago in September 2020. The Fossil Energy Center seeks to further enable the safe, sustainable, and resilient development of offshore reservoirs and national, natural gas upgrading through innovative science and technology. Uh, I'll touch briefly in a moment on the center's efforts that span the upstream, midstream, and downstream space uh, to safely and efficiently utilize natural gas resources in the Eastern Mediterranean. Uh, the motivation for the center goes back over 10 years at this point uh, and started as a result of Senator Mary Landry's visit to Israel. Uh, at that time, the discovery and impending development of the Tamar and Leviathan gas fields prompted Senator Landry to see an opportunity for collaborative efforts between the U.S. and Israel in the offshore energy space, where the hope was that the many lessons learned by the U.S. at times the hard way in the Gulf of Mexico could be shared with our Israeli colleagues. The center is the culmination of that vision. It is highly collaborative between the two nations. The center currently has four partner organizations in the United States and six in Israel. And within the US, the institutions are Tulane University, Louisiana State University, University of Louisiana Lafayette, uh, and Argonne National Lab. The team in Israel, led by co-executive director Simon Emanuel at Hebrew University, uh, includes Hebrew University, Tel Aviv University, the Technion, uh, University of Haifa, the Geological Survey of Israel, and Delic Drilling. This team includes nearly 40 principal investigators between the two countries, and we span a diverse range of skill sets that enable us to bring unique skills to address problems across the upstream, midstream, and downstream space. As all of us have experienced challenges over the last 18 months due to the pandemic, uh, so has the center. Um, we're now approximately a year since the start of the center, and I'm pleased to report that each of our 15 programs are up and running and are staffed and are operating. These projects are diverse and address a broad range of challenges in this space. Um, given time constraints, I won't talk about all of them, but I'd like to give everybody a sense of the type of work being done. And so I'll touch on four ongoing programs. Uh, the first I'll mention is the development of new algorithms to process high density information rapidly. Uh, as an example, within the center, uh, one of our programs is using synthetic aperture sonar data to map seafloors at high resolution. These images are highly data intensive. Developing tools for rapidly automating their analysis will improve our ability to map seafloors more accurately and more rapidly. We're also investigating new approaches and technologies in the fiber optic space and there our goal is to be able to expand the type of information that we can obtain from fiber optic systems within well bores. We think this will improve well control, ultimately enabling more efficient and safer operation. 
We're also investigating the hazard analysis space, partnering primarily in lead with Argonne National Lab uh, and their rich experience in the Gulf of Mexico over many years, where we're developing and applying new risk-based evaluation tools with the goal of improving offshore operations, both in terms of efficiency and safety. And finally, in the downstream space, the center is developing next generation materials in reactor configurations with the goal to enable lower direct conversion technologies to convert methane to higher value molecules such as chemicals uh, and liquid fuels. So hopefully this gives you a sense of the array of programs in the center. The programs are highly interdisciplinary. They're highly collaborative. Nearly every project within the center has partners both within Israel and the United States. Um, but beyond the current portfolio of tasks and projects, the center is also forward looking. Others have brought it up before earlier in this meeting, but as an example, within the center, we are convinced that natural gas is the transition fuel of choice as we shift to a lower carbon future. That said, we're also exploring how emerging spaces such as carbon capture would find a place within the center research portfolio. Uh, so with that, again, I'd like to thank Gideon I'd like to thank the Chamber for their kind invite. Thank you for your time, and I look forward to sharing more with you about the Center over the coming years. Thank you. You couldn't hear all my long discussion because I was muted. <laughs> Sorry. So thank you, Dan. Uh, yes, yeah, so if we have time, I will come back to you because uh, I think uh, we have some very interesting uh, research going on and I have some questions. But uh, okay, yes, having said that, we will now uh, move forward to Shachar Chetzroni, who is the VP of uh, Business Development at Ogwind. Ogwind is a startup company that was uh, supported, uh, among others, by the Ministry of Energy. And we are very happy to host you here, Ashkhal. Thank you very much, Gidon. Thank you for the invitation. So I'm Ashkhal. I'm the VP of Business Development in Ogwind. Uh, I would say a few words about the company and our solution, uh, and also elaborate a bit our, about our first steps in the, in the US uh, today. So uh, Ogwind is a public company established in 2012 by Dr. Or Yogev. And today the company is, is a public company, as I said, traded in the Tel Aviv Stock Exchange since 2019. From the first days of the company, our target was to develop a cheap and non-chemical energy storage solution based on compressed air. So we recognize the penetration, the heavy penetration of renewables all over the world. Uh, since of the beginning of last decade, we already recognized that storage will become a, a, a big issue. And we also noticed that there's a race uh, from the lithium ion uh, manufacturer to develop a chemical solution. Therefore, we, we thought it can be a, a great option to develop a mechanical energy storage uh, alternative for that. So using a, a, a compressed air as a medium for energy storage makes a lot of sense due to main two, two things. First, air is available anywhere and it's free. Second, air behave actually like a spring. You can use it to compress a very high, high pressure, very modular different pressures. So basically you have a modular spring that you can find anywhere for free. However, we were not, were not the first to try to develop an energy storage uh, solution based on compressed air. And when we looked on other developers, tried to do it in the past, we recognized that they all failed due to three main things. First is the cost of the tank to, to, to hold such a, a, a huge pressure of compressed air. Second is the charging efficiency. So converting the electricity to compressed air was done with a, a, a non-efficient way using comp uh, air compressors that has about 25, 30% efficiency. And third is the discharging uh, uh, efficiency. So other developers use uh, usually a gas turbine 
that works in about 50, 45, 50 percent uh, efficiency, meaning that you lose almost half of, your, of the energy just by converting back the compressed air into electricity. So in the first five years of the company, we, all, we just tackled these three issues. First, the cost of the tank. We, we developed a unique uh, 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 tank to hold uh, every pressure of compressed air. By uh, thinking about that, that, that's, that issue of uh, out of the box way of thinking, a very Israeli kind of, of, of uh, way to tackle a problem. So instead of develop a tank, we developed a space. So we are taking like a huge polymer, we are excavating a very shallow ditch, uh, taking a huge polymer like a balloon, placing that inside the ditch and puring, pouring concrete above it. And when the concrete is getting dry, you get actually an underground space and that space is your tank. And that space and that tank is a very cheap one because it's contained only that polymer and the concrete. So we solved the first issue. Second issue, the, the charging efficiency. Instead of using compress compressors, air compressors, we are using our water pumps because water pumps has about 90% efficiency. And here we are replacing the non-efficient air compressors of 30% efficiency with water pumps that are doing that, that the, same, the same mission in 90% efficiency. And third, in order to, dis uh, 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 to discharge the system, we are using water turbine instead of a, a gas turbine because water turbines, again, has about 90% efficiency. And here we solve all the free, the free issues that are there had in the past to have uh, uh, energy storage based on compressed air. Uh, today, we have two products based on these tanks. First of them is, the, uh, we call it Air Smart. It's a product for the uh, uh, energy efficiency market. Uh, it's commercial since 2016 and was sold already to many companies, many factories in Israel, including Nuva, Strauss, Iskar, uh, and many others. We also signed a contract with PepsiCo in California for that product, and we start installation just in the next couple of weeks. Our second product, the air battery that I described before, our main product we uh, secured in the last, last couple of months, we secured about 160 megawatt hour of energy storage system. Uh, we just completed a project of one megawatt hour in the south of Israel that will be connected in the next also couple of weeks to the grid. And we're having discussions with developers of all over the world, including the US, Europe, Emirates, and uh, Southeast Asia. Um, as, as, I, as I said in the beginning, we are uh, uh, starting operation in the US, and the reason for that is pretty clear. US has a lot of uh, renewables. Some of the states in the country uh, uh, as a targets, uh, ambitious targets of 100% uh, uh, renewables by 2045, for example, as California, and also we see states as, as New York and, and Texas uh, as a very attractive uh, states for, for our uh, operation. Uh, the way we, we are uh, um, uh, thinking or the way we are implementing today in the US, our penetration strategy based on our uh, same strategy that we did in Israel. Uh, we are, believe, uh, are big believers in, in, in partnerships. Uh, so we are uh, starting discussion with developers of, on partnerships where the first project is a, like a pilot project together, a small size project. Uh, and we are already discussing about next next step, building together, working together on, on, on a larger project. Uh, last thing I would say a few words about our, about our uh, project uh, in California uh, with PepsiCo. So you, in one end, crossing the ocean, uh, engaging with a company like, like, like PepsiCo gives us access to a huge, huge market. And, and a lot of opportunities in the States. On the other end, we are uh, tackling uh, um, issues of coding and certificates that takes us uh, uh, sometimes. Uh, so we are about one, uh, one year of, of discussing with uh, authorities about uh, uh, coding and uh, that will be uh, completed now, uh, but it's requir required a lot of time and effort uh, and it makes the penetration a, a long process from from our side so that's all for, from uh, from myself thank you and uh, Gideon please take thank you Ashkar
uh, I think Augment is a very exciting company and uh, you should all uh, look into their uh, business. Uh, we will now move on to El Aviv, who is uh, heading Energycom, the new uh, energy Israeli energy community innovation. Elad, <laughs> uh, go ahead. Thank you, Gidon, and uh, <clears throat> thank you for the opportunity to take part in, in this event. So to introduce the um, Energycom, as Gidon mentioned, Energycom is the National Israeli Energy Innovation Community. It was initiated and being supported by the Israeli Ministry of Energy, the Ministry of Economy, and the Israeli Innovation Authority. And it is being managed by two NGOs, the Eilat Eilat Renewable Energy and the Israeli Smart Energy Association. The mission of, uh, of Energycom is to position Israel as a leader at the forefront of the global energy mar market uh, disruption, uh, looking to leverage the innovative local nature, skills, and know-how. I think that Israel managed to, to get quite a good reputation on, on innovation, both in different aspects as, as IT, but recently also in energy, and we, we want to grow this and more. What we do is we focus on three pillars. One is creating awareness among all local stakeholders to the opportunities and challenges of the new energy world. Israel has a very specific energy, um, energy market here as we are an energy island. So we want everyone here to also understand the needs and the opportunities uh, across the globe. The second pillar is building and sharing relevant knowledge, both between players here in Israel, but mostly with a very large ecosystem that we have globally. And the third, very important and very relevant for, for this session is to facilitate business opportunities. And this would be especially between the local players and, global, and the global ecosystem. Uh, the community was is, is fairly new. We were established only about uh, four months ago, but we already have about nearly 1,000 individuals and over 150 organizations in the community, uh, quite intensive activities and, and fast growth. So the goal is that the ministries, the academy, the industry, and the entrepreneurs would have a focal point that they can all get to, and then also the global ecosystem can approach this focal point and we can help everyone to help everyone. So I'm very pleased with, with this opportunity to speak here because I believe that there are superb opportunities for partnerships between the US and Israeli actors, both in on the, on the industry as well as in academic research uh, in all kinds of the energy domains. We naturally won't be able to, to cover all the current research and innovation happening right now in Israel, but just wanted to give you uh, a, few, a few examples. And when we talk about energy, different people have the different perspectives on what do we look on when we're talking about energy. So the concept of Energycom is to look on the whole broad um, spectrum of energy. I also personally believe that everything is well connected. And we believe that the innovation in, in energy technologies is actually just the tip of the iceberg of many other technical and non-technical changes that are about to come and where Israel has a lot to, to offer. So just to give some, some few samples of a few companies and the few directions that uh, I guess that some of the audience are related to. So for to start it with is, is naturally renewable generation. We have different companies here in renewable generation. So we have a few large ones like Ormat or SolarEdge, two that comes from completely different angles to renewable generation. And we have a few that just recently uh, got public like Eco, EcoWave Power, which relates to, to wave power. And we have a few newer ones and smaller ones like H2 Pro on hydrogen or Solaran, which is new type of uh, B-facial solar panels, Levi Leviathan energy on wind. So really there are quite a lot of different aspects and perspectives on renewable generation. And then one, one of the um, probably hottest topic today in new energy and related to renewable energy is energy storage. So Eshar spoke about uh, Ogwind, which is a great example of how to address energy storage 
in a bit of a different way that it was used beforehand. And I just brought here a few examples of completely different type of uh, energy storage solutions. We have ChakraTech, which, um, which their solution is based on flywheel energy storage, mostly for the uh, mobile environment. Brenmiller Energy, which looks on heat heat storage, uh, GenCell, which is hydrogen storage. So again, you can see that we have here different aspects. An area that uh, we have quite a lot of skills and know-how, and we see more and more companies coming up in Israel, is the whole area of smart grid and analytics. And this relates to current and future energy infrastructure. To mention a few, Grid4C, which are very active in the US, F-Site, Empressed, which is also, I think, very active in the US, in Canada, EGM, which relates to censoring and, uh, and automation of the power lines themselves. And here we have also many companies, I won't even go into them, in the security domain, which is very relevant for smart grid and, and analytics. And then if we go uh, from the generation through the grid into the urban or the enterprise space, so urban and microgrid and energy efficiency. And again, different aspects and different companies, and varied, for example, that looks on air condition and HVAC and set point, which is mostly for hotels and, and buildings in order to improve the monitoring and reduce the energy uh, consumption there. Smart green, more or less the same. Jug Jugano is more on street lighting management. Bright Merge and the Sustainable Group are looking on microgrids, where Bright Merge is mostly on more sophisticated uh, environment for microgrids, and, and the Sustainable Group is more on off-grid type of whole type of microgrids. And maybe to mention, last certainly not least, is of course the electric transportation, which is very close to the energy domain and we have there are different companies like drives that are looking on management of uh, ev fleets or electron which looks on very unique interesting type of charging electric vehicles on on the road so uh, this was really just a small sample and i hope that i won't uh, i didn't hurt anyone that i didn't mention th them here but we would be more than glad to provide more information. And I really look forward to proceed the dialogue with the US Chamber of Commerce and interested parties to explore any further possible cooperation opportunities. Thank you, Gideon, back to you. Thank you, Elad. Uh, we have very little time, so I'll uh, maybe ask uh, just uh, one question. I promised to ask Dan, but I think uh, we don't have enough time to ask a te technical question technical question, but I would like to ask about the U.S.-Israeli collaboration and whether you would like to see um, more opportunities or how uh, to encourage the U.S.-Israeli uh, collaboration. Um, yeah, the, the, for the center, it's been wonderful. Um, you know, COVID has made moving people across the ocean difficult, but Many of the programs are, are binational. Um, the more engagement, you know, having students moving between the countries, faculty moving between the countries uh, is I think a wonderful thing for both, both countries. Uh, the center benefits from the, the different viewpoints that each group of scientists bring. Um, BIRD has been a wonderful meeting ground for us to be able to do this. So uh, we look forward to working with BIRD to try to further expand that. Okay, thank, thank you, Dan. I think I will wrap up here and I'll just say a few uh, closing uh, thanks. I want to thank uh, the organizers for uh, inviting us. Uh, it's been a great opportunity to present uh, our point of view. I think the collaboration between U.S. and Israel is uh, exemplary in the, uh, certainly in the innovation arena. Uh, uh, between uh, both uh, parties. Uh, I believe uh, very much in this collaboration. We have a lot to gain from it. The challenges are great and uh, certainly it's very exciting to be in this field uh, with so many quick changes and, uh, and great, uh, great innovation. Uh, so thank you and that, that uh, concludes our panel. Well, thank you, Guidon. That was a terrific panel and, and just a taste of sort of the innovation potential and opportunity uh, in the U.S.-Israel space. I think there, there's much, much more. We could have had a, a full day program at least 
on, on other models and other companies and other different kinds of initiatives. So I hope for our participants, this is just a snippet. Um, let me thank again our partners at the U.S. Department of Energy and the Ministry of Energy for their great partnership in this forum. I also want to give a special thanks to the Chambers team, Ahmed, Jamil, Mary, Margaret, Greg, and Mickey, for putting on a, a great show today. Uh, we've had we've heard a lot of important themes and threads throughout the, the program. This is clearly a critical moment in the fight against climate change. We know that this is our greatest challenge today, and getting to a lower carbon future is our shared mission. We've heard that there's strong political and governmental support to expand U.S.-Israeli bilateral ties to serve this mission. There's terrific government programs like the U.S. Israel Energy Center, Bird Energy, and, and obviously an enabling environment for U.S.-Israeli partnerships in energy. But I think you know both governments are looking at other ways to deepen the partnership, and I think uh, it's important to be part of that dialogue. Um, Energy, as we heard from Osama, is a catalyst for peace. The discovery of natural gas in Israel alongside other finds in the region are, are changing the region for the better, changing the economic, the energy, and the political landscape in huge ways. And the United States and our companies and, and government are, are part of that, that change. And finally, I would say mitigating the effects of climate change and cooperation on, on, on energy and a lot of these issues requires public-private partnership. We heard this loud and clear from speakers from government and industry, and, and we look forward to furthering this dialogue with both governments and a broad range of companies that are engaged on this arena to, to seek out those opportunities, to create those opportunities, and to catalyze more partnerships in this, in this important uh, arena. So for those that have joined us from far and, ri uh, far and wide, if you're looking to get involved with our efforts to promote and advance U.S.-Israel commercial ties, if you're a company looking for opportunities or partners in Israel uh, or find ways to connect into the ecosystem, let us know how we can help. Uh, the U.S. Chamber and our U.S.-Israel Business Council is, is ready to help. Um, thank you all for joining us here today, and uh, we are now adjourned. Thank you.